and I am excited to introduce her for you. So Dr. Taya Johnson is a triple board uh, certified in child and adult and adolescent psychiatry as well as forensic psychiatry. Dr. Johnson is currently an assistant professor of medicine here at UT Tyler Health Science Center and in Tyler and treats children, adolescents, and young adults. She also serves as the program director for our newly established child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship program here at the university. Dr. Johnson received her medical degree from the University of Louisville and completed her adult psychiatry fellowship, excuse me, residency training at the University of Miami. Um, her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at the University of Louisville and then her forensic psychiatry fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. Her specialty interests include treating children, adults and uh, uh, adolescents and young adults with various uh, psychiatric illnesses, especially within the minority populations and to conducting evaluations specifically related to forensic psychiatry. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to Dr. Taya Johnson and Dr. Johnson, I'll hand Hand this over to you now. Thank you, Laura. Um, can you tell me which which screen you're seeing? I am seeing the correct screen. The correct one. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like she said, I am uh, Dr. Taya Johnson, going to be presenting on the mole hill that became a mountain. Um, addressing child and adolescent mental health early. So our goals and objectives for this presentation is that at the end of the presentation, you all should be able to describe the prevalence, prevalence of mental disorders in children and adolescents to understand the importance of addressing them early, um, be able to describe the different options to consider when addressing mental health in children and adolescents in the primary care setting to prevent development into more severe problems. And then I'm going to provide some examples of some screening tools that primary care providers can use to help assess for mental disorders in children and adolescents. So first, why is addressing mental health important for primary care providers. So um, mental health is a very broad um, label that encompasses a range of mental, sure. emotional, social, and behavioral functioning. Mental health, like physical health, occurs along a continuum from good to poor and varies over time in different conditions and at different ages. So just as this this little um, graphic that I found online says mental health is just important as physical health. And so we're going to talk about the numbers to, to we're going to look at the numbers to, to um, reiterate this point. So according to the two, 2022 National Health Care Quality and Disparities Report, um, Nearly 20% of children and young people ages 3 to 17 in the United States have some sort of mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral disorder. Um, when it comes to suicide, suicidal behaviors among high school students increased more than 40% in the decade before 2019. And then we, when we think about disability, mental health challenges were the leading cause of death and disability in um, this child age group, which was exacer exacerbated during the COVID pandemic. Going back to suicide, um, according to the CDC, um, Suicide is the second leading cause of death in those ages 10 to 24. So if you look at this um, graphic, the the green squares under the, age, the, the 10 to 14 age range, 15 to 24 age range, and even actually 25 to 34 age range, suicide is the second leading cause of death in those age groups. And then when we're talking about little children, um, one in six children ages two to eight years old has a developmental, has a mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder of some sort. So one in six children. I'm sure you all um, see a lot of children. So think about that. One in six children ages two to eight have some kind of mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. Now, when it comes to um, the data, 
um, from the mental health surveillance among children um, from 2013 to 2019, the most prevalent mental health disorders diagnosed among U.S. children and adolescents between ages 3 and 17 were um, ADHD and anxiety. Each were affecting one in 11 children. So one out of 11 children were affected by ADHD or an and or anxiety. Um, in those aged 12 to 17, one fifth of the children have experienced a major depressive episode at least one in their once so far in their life. In 2019, high school students reported that about um, high school students reported about 40% of them reported persistently feeling sad or hopeless in the past year, and about 20% reported seriously considering a suicide attempt. Now, seven in 100,000 children and adolescents ages 10 to 19 died by suicide in 2018 and 2019, which is a significant number of children. And about 10% um, of children and adolescents aged 3 to 17 had received some type of mental health service in the past year. Um, well, no, I'm sorry, 10% had received mental health services and then ages 12 to 17, they reported, um, one out of four of them reported having mental health services within the past year but the age 3 to 17 that could have been at any point in their lifetime um but the the 12 to 17 year old report one out of four reported mental health services within the past year for kids ages 3 to 17 parents reported about 8% of children had taken medications for issues within the past year So when we're looking at um, the prevalence of mental disorders and how they change with age, we see in the early years um, that, that we see that over the years, diagnoses of ADHD, anxiety, and depression are more common with increased age. Behavior problems are more common among children ages six to 11 than older or younger children. So if we look at this chart, um, the first, set of uh, graphs, the blue set, and then the rust orange set, I guess is what we'll call that color. Those are representing depression and anxiety. And as you see, of, as the age groups change, the prevalence of depression and anxiety increases with, with those um, diagnoses. Whereas with behavior disorders, the yellow mustard colored um, graph uh, bars on the end, show that the ages 6 to 11 have the highest rate of behavioral disorders compared to the 3 to 5 age range and then the 12 to 17 age range. So what is all this telling us? Basically, these data confirm that mental disorders among children continue to be a substantial public health concern. And thus, US PCPs have to be very diligent in screening in assessing for mental disorders by being equipped with the tools and skills to do so because we need your help. We can't, usually by the time folks come to us, it's a, already a major problem. So you all are the ones that are going to have to pick up on these things early and that's what we're going to talk about next. So how do we address mental health issues in the primary care setting to prevent them from getting worse? So we are going to spend um, some time talking in public health prevention terms, specifically um, spending most of our time on the differences between primary prevention and secondary prevention um, and not so much focusing on ter tertiary prevention because tertiary prevention is basically the by the time that they come to see a child or adolescent psychiatrist or have been referred to one, that's usually where tertiary prevention is. So we're trying to catch them early either with primary prevention or secondary prevention. So let's spend our time talking about those two um, public health prevention terms. So first, when we're talking about primary prevention, um, primary prevention is the focus on eliminating risk factors and using tactics that promote mental and emotional well-being. So what does this look like in the primary care setting? 
in the primary care setting, this is going to be things that you all already do, which is um, utilizing the times when you're doing developmentally appropriate anticipatory guidance at, at well child visits. These are the things that you're going to talk about that's going to help eliminate some of those re risk factors and um, promote emo mental and emotional well-being. So what is what are those things? Talking to parents about positive parenting skills, asking them questions about how do they deal with, you know, their kids on a day to day basis and what things that they can do to um, improve the way that they parent their children. Um, asking about sleep hygiene. This is huge um, because a lot of times kids have horrible sleep hygiene and so they don't sleep well and then they have a lot of behavioral problems because they don't sleep well and so asking about sleep hygiene and talking about sleep hygiene and ways to improve sleep hygiene um, is very important to talk about at each well child visit you all could also can talk about age appropriate disciplining techniques such as having consistent rules limits and consequences um, so that parents can understand how to utilize um, appropriate disciplining and not just you know some people only believe in doing corporal punishment but and so talking to them about other ways to do discipline that don't require um, corporal punishment you all can also talk about developing a consistent daily routine. Children do much, much better when they have a consistent daily routine compared to having a chaotic um, routine. They don't know what's going on. They, they need that consistency. They love that consistency. They thrive on that consistency. So if you can talk about that at your um, well child visits to kind of help them develop what that routine will look like for them as a family, that is um, very important. Another big one, especially now in our, in our um, generation now is limiting TV and screen time. Um, that, you know, the data is starting to show us more and more the consequences of too much um, TV or screen time for children and impacting their, um, the development of their brain, their ability to interact with others. Um, when it comes to teenagers, um, you know, it contributing to depressed um, thoughts and behaviors. So talking to families about limiting their TV and screen time is huge and going to be a major um, risk factor that can be eliminated by talking with them at their well child visit. Also talking about praising and rewarding good behaviors. Not only do parents need to know how to effectively and appropriately discipline the children, but they also need to know how to effectively and appropriately praise good behaviors for um, and, and reward good behaviors when kiddos are doing the right thing so that they know with positive reinforcement, this is the type of behaviors that I need to continue to do. And so this is something that can be talked at each well child visit as well. Also talk to the parents about spending time with their child daily and engaging in positive activities with them daily. Um, because, you know, I know that a lot of times our families are very stressed, um, very, you know, parents are overworked, kids, um, you know, with school are frustrated with school and stuff. And so sometimes it can be hard for parents to incorporate that daily time, but incorporating that daily time and engaging in positive activity can help the child so much um, as far as preventing development of some mental health issues. And so talking about that at the well child visit and trying to find ways where they can at least spend at least 10 minutes or so with their kids and talking with them and asking them how their day went and interacting with them, playing with them if the child is young enough and still wants to play, things like that to give that, um, that improve that bond um, which improves the emotional and mental well-being of the child. And then a, a lot of things, a lot of uh, families have gotten away from having meals together as a family, but um, family meals is a very important, um, very important tactic that could be used to, again, help make the family feel more bonded and getting along and helping with um, 
promoting mental and emotional well-being. So again, all of these things are things that you can discuss at a well-child visit. It doesn't take an extra step outside of that. Some of these things you may already be talking about and some of these things you might not have thought about um, incorporating into your well-child visits. And so maybe you should do so um, again because the, talking about these things and helping parents with these things are going to eliminate the risk factors of developing mental health issues and it's going to help promote mental and emotional well-being which is which is important for that prevention. And so as a primary care provider, um, you all have some advantages to addressing mental health concerns that you may not feel you all have advantages, but you actually do. Um, because you are seeing pages patients longitudinally, you are also able to develop that therapeutic relationship with patients because you've been seeing them, you know, for a very long time, sometimes from birth, sometimes you've been following a family through, you know, for generations. And so you have you have ability to develop a therapeutic relationship with your patients because of that um, longitudinal um, connection with them. You will you are able to promote social and emotional health at every contact, which is what I was talking about with the well child visits, asking those questions, promoting anticipatory guidance that relates to improving um, social and emotional well health and well being. You all can prevent met, um, mental health issues through education and anticipatory guidance. Um, again, every contact well child visits, you can always do that. Um, and then you all have the um, ability to intervene in a timely way if and when risk concerns and symptoms emerge because they're already your patients. They don't have to wait on a wait list to get seen by somebody else. You all can do something pretty quickly um, because you see um, patients so frequently and know them so well. So actually primary care is primed to address mental health issues, even though I know a lot of primary care providers do not feel comfortable doing so. Now we will talk about um, secondary prevention. So secondary prevention is basically most often seen in the form of screening. Um, and so when you're seeing a child, um, you you have to be able to, you've out, you pretty much prop more than likely already established that alliance with the patient and the family. And so therefore you can take that initial action on any identified mental health and social concern, again, which comes in the form of doing some screening. So if you make screenings, a general thing that you do with everyone, this becomes basically second nature for your practice. And so screening serves as two, has two roles that it serves. Um, it's aimed at first for um, early detection, early disease detection in asymptomatic people who can be treated early before symptoms become a problem. And then it also allows for the detection of risk factors that can be altered to prevent disease. So that's the two ways where you're going to use screening um, screenings in um, the primary care setting. Screening can um, lead to early detection and prevention of more serious outcomes and disease. And so because of this, that's going to our whole entire title of the presentation. We're going to prevent the molehill from turning into a mountain when we can do that early detection and prevention of more serious outcomes. And the primary care setting is primed to conduct mental health screenings because you can do behavioral health screenings at an early age and doing that screening early is important for improving long-term mental health outcomes. So if you start, you know, from day one, um, screening issues, risk factors, things like that early with anticipatory guidance and stuff, you can continue to do that throughout the um, child and the family's lives because you see them frequently. And so therefore you can start that screening process early. So when it comes to screenings, how are, what does the data show to, for us that 
PCPs are doing, um, how PCPs are doing with screening at the current moment. So right now, about 50% of children with clinically significant behavioral emotional issues are not detected even when they are well known to a pediatric practice. So I want you all to think about that. Half of the children with clinically significant issues, mental health issues, they're not even detected by a uh, by the pediatrician or um, primary care provider, even when the primary care provider knows that child and family pretty well. Um, research also shows us that the um, ability, that the primary care provider's ability to identify behavioral and mental health issues based on clinical judgment alone is very, very low. Um, so without using some kind of tool or assessment screen to help, trying to just come up with, trying to just um, identify the behavioral health problems just based on clinical judgment, you're going to miss a lot of kids, which is probably why 50% of children are not detected even when they're known to a pediatrician. Um, PCPs, Primary care providers are less likely to identify problems in minority children or children whose primary language is not English um, because you end up missing um, some of those key points and key issues. Also, when it comes to children with chronic medical conditions, they typically have a higher prevalence of mental health problems, but those mental health problems um, if they go unrecognized in this population can cause um, excessive use of medical services and hinder those children's adherence to their medical treatment because if they're not if their mental health issues aren't being um, identified or recognized the the whoever is taking care of the child that's probably is more specialized care is going to, you know, do more referring or testing um, instead of addressing their, men their mental health issues because they may think it's more of a medical issue and not a mental health issue. Um, also, it is estimated that 75% of children with mental health disorders are not treated at all um, of any sort. So, um, Research also shows there's some differences when it comes to the use of screening tools in primary care providers. So pediatricians actually have been found to be more likely than family medicine physicians to use screening tools and that pediatricians are more likely to screen for attachment issues, temper tantrums, sleep disturbances, and school problems compared to family medicine physicians as well. And then when it comes to rural primary care providers, which we are in a rural area. Um, uh, rural PC primary care providers were more likely to respond never or always when they were asked about their screening tool use. Um, so it was like they were on either end of the spectrum. Either they never use a screening tool or they always use a screening tool. And then when it came to urban primary care providers, um, they were more likely to use screening tools some of the times. And so when we're talking about this, all pediatricians really need the skills to promote mental health, officially perform psychosocial assessments, and to provide primary and secondary preventative services. If we're able to, if you all are able to triage for psychiatric emergencies um, that and, and social emergencies, that's going to help kids get seen sooner um, and get referred to higher levels of care if they need those. Um, but you have to be able to, to triage for those. So what are some challenges that primary care providers have with mental health screening in the primary care setting? Because there are some challenges, right? So, um, First and foremost, children and adolescents, they typically show symptoms of multiple disorders and problems at the same time. So um, usually their symptoms are triggered by events or uh, their social environment. And so it can kind of make things a little difficult. 
Um, up to a third of children seen in a primary care setting have some kind of behavioral or emotional issues which impair their functioning, but they don't meet the criteria for a specific disorder. So our DSM-5, which is our, our the, the, the um, text that we use to get our criteria for, um, for diagnosing mental health conditions, Sometimes kids may have some pieces of symptoms, but they might not have all of the symptoms to get a formal diagnosis of a specific disorder. But the, the few symptoms that they do have are causing them a lot of uh, functional impairment. And so because of that, it gets difficult because there's no that limits what is evidence based treatment. Uh, what is what options do you have for evidence based treatment for a child that technically doesn't meet? the criteria for a diagnosis, even though they are having functional impairment. So that makes it hard um, to know what to do as a primary care provider in that situation. Also, the primary care model does not fit with the mental health model because you all as primary care providers, as you know, you see patients for short visits over a longer time period. Whereas when, when kids come to see me at, the, at um, the child and adolescent clinic, mental health clinic, they the, our appointments are longer and for a short or a limited time period. So that makes it a little difficult because you have time constraints. I know that's one thing that a lot of primary care providers talk about when it comes to addressing mental health issues in some of your patients is you don't have the time. And it, I mean, it's, it's there. The primary care model just doesn't match how the mental health model is. And so that makes it difficult as well. Also, when we think about um, evidence-based treatments, a lot of them do not consider the impacts of social determinants of health that they have on children and their symptoms. And so while, yes, you might use, you know, a certain medication that you think is appropriate for that case, but you don't see the child improving because sometimes the issue is not just that the kid needs a medication, but there's a whole bunch of social determinants of health that are impacting that child and or the child's family. And so you're not seeing the results that are that is expected to be seen from the data because the data doesn't um, consider those social determinants of health. And then the other point, um, other challenge is that just because we treat mental illness does not necessarily mean that we promote wellness because promoting wellness or utilizing anticipatory guidance, that's going to prevent illness. But a lot of times we don't focus on promoting wellness. We just focus on the treatment of mental illness and the promoting wellness is what's going to prevent us from allowing that molehill to turn into a mountain. So as a um, primary care provider providing mental health interventions, what are going to be your goals? You're, as a primary care provider, you are the gateway to specialty services. So one of your goals is going to be to, um, to um, you are the gateway to specialty services. So patients who need specialty care are going to be um, able to get referred by you all. Um, and so that's important because you all can know when to refer somebody to us. You all are also a safety net. So you all are able to catch capture patients and families who are lost to follow up with specialized mental health care. Once they've had that referral, um, you all can find out, hey, did you go to that appointment? Um, you know, I know that it was coming up. Did you follow up? Have you been going to your appointments? If so, great. What's been happening with your appointments? If not, why not? What's going on? Why you're not going anymore? But you all are, are able to be that safety net to ask those questions and help. If patients are lost to follow up, you can help get them back into care. Um, another goal is for early intervention. If you catch things early, you prevent worsening and the day things don't become as severe, hence not turning the molehill into the mountain. And then we, um, you all promote positive mental health, which helps children thrive, helps improve their emotional um, and social, emotional and mental well-being, because you all promote positive mental health or can promote positive mental health. 
So when we're talking about utilizing primary care providers um, to help screen and assess for mental health issues, um, we need to talk about the difference between collaborative care versus task shifting. So collaborative care is when there is an effective partnership among primary care and specialists, and um, the two usually work together, um, sometimes even co-located, not always. Um, but in order to do effective collaborative care, you cannot do that without proper task shifting. And so task shifting is what is when primary care providers deliver some specialty services, okay? So this is where primary care providers, specifically talking about mental health issues, you're gonna do some of that early detection and intervention for mental health issues. You're going to, um, you're gonna, you're gonna do that because one, waiting times are way too long for specialty care. So it's, it's not, it's not good for a child or their families to suffer with symptoms all because um, it's, you know, oh, that's a mental health issue. I have to refer you out. I can't do anything about it now. That just prolongs the suffering and prolongs the symptoms, which makes things worse and worse over time because the earlier you can address things, the better the outcomes. So, we don't we can't wait for especially in our area but across the country there's just the wait times to get in with mental health especially for children and adolescents is way too long so we cannot as primary care providers wait that time period before anything is done because all we're going to do is actually you know promote that molehill to turn into a mountain instead of preventing that from happening um Another reason why we need to do task shifting is that a lot of patients prefer treatment from their primary care provider instead of their special instead of a specialist. Why is that? Because they have that bond with you all. They have that therapeutic relationship. So therefore, they are more likely to listen to your recommendations, trust you when you're saying you believe this diagnosis is going on or something else is going on, and they are more likely to take what you say. So task shifting is needed for primary care providers to deliver some mental health services um, when needed. So what are some brief therape therapeutic interventions that primary care providers could, could, could use? Um, for those with, um, so first and foremost, for primary care providers to utilize interventions, they need to be few in number. So um, because they can, the interventions need to be few in number to where they can cross multiple diagnosis, diagnostic categories. So it's not that, you know, you have a set of interventions for anxiety, a set of interventions for depression, a set for ADHD, yada, 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 but that you can utilize the interventions across multiple diagnoses. Um, they also need to be easy to implement. And then um, they need to broadly address early intervention, family and social influences and wellness promotion, like we've been talking about. So with those with mild to moderate symptoms, children with mild to moderate symptoms, the goals of the therapeutic intervention is to improve functioning, reduce their distress, and hopefully prevent development of a later or more serious disorder. So that's going to be the goal with someone with mild to moderate symptoms. For those with serious symptoms needing specialty care, the goals of the therapeutic interventions are going to help, to help them overcome barriers to accessing care um, and then decreasing symptoms and distress while waiting for a referral. So again, this is why you're going to be doing something in the interim until that referral is able to happen. And then the, you're also with someone with serious symptoms, you're able to monitor their functioning while you are awaiting that referral to specialty care, okay? So when we're talking about brief therapeutic interventions, they should be no more than 10 to 15 minutes to help prevent interference with the flow of your practice. And there's two different types of brief therapeutic interventions that a primary care provider can use. They are something called common factors, or um, communication skills, which are just basically effective interventions that are common to various therapies across diagnoses. These are skills that help you build 
and improve the therapeutic alliance and target symptoms like anger, ambivalence, hopelessness, and family conflict. And then you have common elements, which um, are components of various therapies that could be applied to different conditions or disorders. So basically, it's a problem-based treatment, not a diagnostic-based treatment. Um, but these elements can, can go to can be applied anywhere. Um, and these common elements can help decrease stress and improve symptoms. And so this is a table from um, one of the references that I've used for this presentation um, that talks about common elements. And so um, like for anxiety, the presenting problem is anxiety. Um, the common element that you could do with that is graded exposure to whatever is anxiety provoking or modeling of how to handle or uh, manage um, coping mechanisms when anxiety is heightened. Um, another one with for ADHD and oppositional problems, using tangible rewards, praising the child, praising the child, um, helping with monitoring, talking about timeout or effective commands and limit settings, um, things like that. And then low mood, cognitive coping mechanisms, problem solving strategies, activity scheduling, behavior rehearsal or uh, social skills building. So um, this policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Pediatrics Mental Health Competencies Policy Statement goes into a lot of information um, to help guide primary care providers how to incorporate um, mental health, the, mental health um, screening and assess an assessment into your pediatric pra practice. Please see these this resource. It is um, there's a lot of information here to help you with prevention and early intervention, and it can talk to you. It can tell you how you can implement that in your clinics. This this article I used a lot for a lot of this presentation, um, and it's literally I just went to the American Academy of Pediatrics and put in the search bar mental health competencies, and then it came up. Um, but it was very well, um, it gave a lot of good information, and I think you all would find it very, very helpful, um, a helpful resource to utilize, um, to incorporate mental health screening and assessment in your practices. Now, this screen is not meant for you to look at and look at all the individual squares right now, but this, is a screenshot from the American Academy of Pediatrics Mental Health Competencies, and they give a flow chart as to how a step-by-step -step algorithm to help primary care providers integrate mental health screening and assessment into their visits. So that was, um, I really thought that was helpful that that article had all of that in there in this one algorithm um, again, it looks very busy. It looks like it's a lot, but it's a lot of helpful information as to next steps and what you can do um, to integrate mental health screening and assessment. And then, you know, do you need to refer to an emergency room or, you know, what what can you do? It, it goes through each step. All of this it's just beautifully written. So I wanted to show you all this so you can see that when you look at that um, American Academy of Pediatrics Mental Health Competencies article, this is in there and you might find this very beneficial to, um, to help you all integrate mental health screening and assessment into your visits. And then um, just to bring home the point that the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry has a policy statement on mental health screenings in a primary care um, setting as well. And so basically they recommend for primary care to do routine mental health screening um, to increase awareness, early recognition and early intervention for mental health problems in children and youth um, to provide um, they recommend to have comprehensive mental health education, resources and services may be made available to patients, families, and clinicians, and then um, recommending innovative collaboration between primary care and mental health clinicians to improve access to mental health services. And so this is a presentation about CPAN. 
for for CPAN. And so CPAN can help with some of these things. Um, and so you can call CPAN to speak to a child or adolescent psychiatrist to get a free informal consultation. Um, it, this allows for discussion of diagnostic treatment or referral dilemmas. And the research shows that this type of um, program, because we're not, Texas is not the only state with this type of program. There are multiple states with a similar program um, like CPAN, they just call them different things. The research shows that this is very effective in increasing primary care providers' willingness and ability to manage mental health issues in children because they're able to have that basically curbside consult with a child or adolescent psychiatrist and learn from them. Also, you can engage in our Project ECHO, which is offered twice a year, and it allows for um, you to learn some knowledge and skills related to psychosocial concerns. Um, and it's over time, like it's a it's a set of um, lectures that occurs. And this allows for primary care providers to have collaboration with child adolescent psychiatrists by discussing specific cases. Um, and so we utilize Project ECHO as part of CPAN. And again, it's offered twice a year. We're almost done with this year's, um, this session's, um, or I guess this, um, this Project ECHO right now, but it will start back up again in the fall. We do it in the fall and in the spring. So you have multiple opportunities to engage in Project ECHO and learn. All right, so what are some examples of screening tools that you can use in your office in a primary care uh, as a primary care provider? Now, remember, I'm going to go through these these different screeners. These are screening tools, not diagnostic tools. So just because a kid is positive or negative on a screening tool does not necessarily mean that that is the diagnosis. You still must conduct further evaluation after a patient screens positive. So you still have to ask questions. You still have to follow up with information. It is not a substitution for the clinical interview. Okay. So you still have to do your part doing a clinical interview, but this can, the screening tools can guide you on questions to follow up on and ask for more information so that you can make a diagnosis. So first is um, the screen for childhood and child anxiety related emotional disorders or the SCARED. The SCARED is a self-report screening tool for childhood anxiety disorders. It has 41 items on it um, and it's to be used in children ages 8 to 18 years old because the child needs to be able to read um, and answer the questions. Um, there are child and parent forms available. So if there's a younger kiddo that's um, so it's validated for 8 to 18, but if you want to try to get an idea from um, a parent who of a younger child, like a child younger than 8, you can still kind of get an idea if there's some anxiety going on from um, them utilizing the parent form. Um, but you definitely, in a child who's old enough, you definitely want to um, have their form over and not just the parent form. And, I, and the reason why I say that is because anxiety is a, an internal, um, an internal, internalizing um, diagnosis, it's a, an internalizing set of symptoms. And so parents may not see the anxiety that the child may feel. Um, so you want to have both forms, but if you can't have both, you can only get one, then the child is going to be better. Have Having the child version is going to be better than having the parent version. Um, unless the child is younger than eight, then you can use the parent version. Um, there are multiple translations available with the scared, and it is reliable for panic disorder or significant somatic symptoms, generalized anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder, social phobia, and school avoided symptoms. And it can be completed within 10 minutes while waiting to be seen, um, whether that's in the waiting room or if you give it to them while they are sitting in the, um, in the um, room in the clinic waiting for you to get there, they can fill that out at that time. Another um, tool, screening tool, is the PHQ-9 Modified for Teens, 
or the PHQ-9A. And I know a lot of primary care providers have heard of the PHQ-9 and use the PHQ-9 quite a bit. Well, the PHQ-9A is modified for children and adolescents um, for ages 11 to 18 years old. So this one is more, um, this one is better to utilize for teens, early adolescents, compared to using the PHQ-9 that you may use with an adult patient. Um, again, this is self-administered, and it assesses anxiety, eating, mood, and substance use disorders among children and adolescents, um, primary care patients. And it takes about five minutes or less to take this one. So this is a short one um, to take. There's also um, the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale for Children, or CESDC. This is a screening tool for depression. It is a self-report um, tool. It has 20 items um, regarding depressive symptoms, and this can be utilized in children ages 6 to 17, and again, can be completed in about, 15, in about five minutes. Then we have the ASK, the ASQ, or the Ask Suicide Screening Questions. Um, this screens for suicide risk, not for depression, and this identifies those who need a more assessment looking into um, their suicidal thoughts or um, risk factors if they have them. It's, it's four brief questions. It is approved for use in all ages by the Joint Commission. It takes literally 20 seconds to administer, and it's available in multiple languages. Now, the NIH has an entire toolkit that goes along with the ASK on their website. Um, literally, you can just Google the ASQ, and it, the whole thing will come up. Um, and so you all can um, look at that um, toolbox, toolkit, I'm sorry, toolkit on, it talks like how to implement this, what to do, like it literally talks you through all the steps with, um, with utilizing the ask on the NIH's website. Then we have um, the NICHQ Vanderbilt Assessment Scale. Um, this helps to assess symptoms of ADHD in children ages 6 to 12, even though we might use um, this form in preschool through adolescence, but it's validated for children ages 6 to 12. Um, it includes both the core symptoms of ADHD and a rating of performance, as well as providing a screen for common comorbid conditions, including anxiety, depression, um, oppositional defiance disorder, and conduct disorder. There are parent and teacher's versions, and you need both versions with the Vanderbilt because you need more than one setting to diagnose ADHD. The symptoms cannot be present in one setting and then not present in another. That does not meet the criteria for ADHD, so you need both parent and teacher versions to um, assist with um, you being able to make the diagnosis of ADHD once you're utilizing the Vanderbilt scale. Um, it's very easy to complete for parents um, doesn't require, it only requires a slightly below third grade reading level for them. Then we have the CRAFT, C-R-A-F-F-T 2.0, and this is a substance use screening tool for adolescents ages 12 to 21. It has nine questions. It can be self-report or administered by a clinician. There is also a Craft 2.1 plus N version that contains extra questions related to tobacco and nicotine use, which was updated in 2020. Um, this is can be found online and it's available in multiple languages. And I didn't say this before I started going through these screening tools, but literally all of these screening tools can be found online for free that you can easily download the PDF versions and utilize them in your clinic if you don't already have them. Some of our, um, some of the primary care providers in our hub, Tyler, Tyler's hub, UT Tyler's hub, um, receives a um, welcome packet that has a lot of screening tools. And some of these are already in there. But even if you are not, um, part of UT Tyler's hub and have not got the welcome packet, you can still easily access these. These are all free. None of these require pay, um, any paying for them. And then we have the um, pediatric ACEs and related 
Life Event Screener or the Pearls. This is a screening tool for children and adolescents ages 0 to 19, and it screens for um, adverse childhood experiences in that age group. Now, this is different from the ACES screen that people typically use, and the ACES screen that people typically use was actually validated for adults. So that's why the Pearls is better to utilize than the um, then the ACES screen, the general ACES screen, um, because the, the PEARLS is specific to children and adolescents. Um, so this ex includes, the, the PEARLS includes a screening for ACES, um, adverse childhood experiences um, in part one, and then there's also a screen for additional adversities in part two. So it's a two-pager um, screening questionnaire. Um, there are three versions. There is a child version to be used in ages 0 to 11 that should be completed by the parent or caregiver. There's a Pearl's adolescent for ages 12 to 19 to be completed by a parent or caregiver. And then there's a Pearl's adolescent self-report for ages 12 to 19 to be completed by the adolescent. Um, this tool is also available in multiple languages and um, so if you have a kid that's 12 to 19 you should get a parent version and a self-report at the adolescent version as well whereas if it's a child 0 to 11 years old you only need it completed by the parent so after you utilize the screening tool what do you do um, well, first and foremost, you need to discuss both positive and negative results of the screen to make sure that there's no misunderstandings with the questions on the screener. Um, and so a negative screen allows for you to confirm that there are no problems. And then a positive screen allows for you to confirm if there are problems and then to get more information about the problems that are present. Um, the conversations that you have um, that can the, the conversation that come from using a screener is much more important than the results of the screener itself. Again, you need to not just use the screener as, oh, they screen positive, this means they have this diagnosis. No, they screen positive, now let's ask more questions so I can find out what's going on with this child or and or family, what's going on, how can I help? So the conversation after the screener is definitely more important than what the screener tells you. One thing that we must make sure um, is that even if you do the screener and somebody screens positive, please, please, please do not refer all positive screens. If you don't know what to do next with this positive screen, call CPAN to discuss the results with a child adolescent psychiatrist. And our phone number um, for statewide use is on the screen um, because we can talk you through what you should do next, what the next option should be, if medication should be tried, yada, yada, yada. We can, we can t help you figure out next steps, but don't just automatically refer with a positive screen because all that's going to do is bombard the mental health system with referrals that we cannot get to in a timely manner. And then again, we're going to be dealing with the molehill turning into a mountain. Um, and then if there is a situation that when you discuss with the child or adolescent psychiatrist by calling CPAN and we feel, you know what, maybe we need to do a one time direct consult, CPAN is able to do that if that's what we feel is necessary. But again, you're going to discuss the results with the child or adolescent psychiatrist to tell you where to move and what's next. And that is all I have. If there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. That really covered a lot of information um, as well as some of the concerns I have heard from providers. Um, you mentioned that there is, you know, quite a waiting list. Um, last I heard for Northeast Texas, it can be anywhere between eight and 12 months to see a child psychiatrist. Um, so some of the challenges we have in rural areas may be a little different than what might be what they might be out in a more urban area. So you know when you when you see that there's such a, a long wait list, 
what kind of recommendations do you have for providers who are very nervous about treating child mental health at all? Um, it, be it ADHD, be it um, uncomplicated depression or anxiety. Uh, what do you recommend when when they can't just send the referral and, and have that child seen in a, in a quick period of time? Um, so I, I believe that this presentation talked about all of that. Like you got to start with the screeners. You got to ask questions. You got to get information. And then if you are still unsure of what to do and you still feel um, nervous, you have CPAN here in Texas to utilize to help you through the process. What do you recommend for those providers who have not treated previously and the concern is um, black box warnings? Um, I hear about that when I go out to clinics and I visit with providers um, that may have been practicing for quite some time and they're concerned about those black box warnings. How do you how do you address that with a, a colleague? Um, I mean, in general, dealing with that. If you have a question about understanding the black box warning, then I would recommend, you know, consulting someone who knows how to do that. So for us here in Texas, we're going to utilize CPAN and we can talk you through what um, how to interpret the black box warning data, because just because the black box warning is there does not mean that you don't use the medication. And so we can talk about you know exactly what the black box warning means if someone has confusion about that if they want to call and speak with us at CPAN. But the black box warning should not prevent a provider from utilizing um, the treatment that is evidence-based that tells us works for anxiety and depression all because the black box warning is there. The black box warning is just giving you the um, notion of, hey, make sure you are aware that this can happen, but that's not saying you can't use it or don't use it. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I'd like to open it up, uh, open up the call lines um, for questions for Dr. Johnson. We have a, a great number of individuals who are attending today. Um, there is a comment in Texas, all counties are assigned a local mental health authority. They are available to take referrals for behavioral health concerns. Um, absolutely, Tim, they are. Um, one of the things that we have found is that uh, there is quite a waiting list as well for local mental health authorities in Northeast Texas. Um, and that's why CPAN, uh, one of the reasons that CPAN is available, um, we have a turnaround time of uh, 24 hours for vetted referrals and resources um, for that are specific to the needs of those patients. Um, we have uh, about 360 different referral referral options and resource options for Northeast Texas that we've built into our own database. Um, and we know that our, our colleagues down in UT, uh, excuse me, at, at UTMB have a large database as well. Um, yes, the LMHAs are definitely great options for emergencies for sure. Other questions?